Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impentant heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, time, our second session this morning. I pray that as we get into our study, that, we would, uh, that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we would apply uh, our heart to understanding these matters so that we would be utilized and effectually utilized by you, Father, as we serve and have been given the honor and privilege to being ambassadors for your honor and glory. Father, what a privilege it is to be able to share the very message that uh, saved us with others. Father, as we look at this uh, second part of the gospel here and the escape tactics that men and women and, and even children will formulate to try to escape uh, your wrath, uh, to escape the judgment, uh, your judgment, Father. May we know how to uh, present the information given here uh, that will effectually work in them and challenge and test uh, their volition. And ultimately, hopefully, that they will, if there's any softness in their heart, uh, lead them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for them. Father, we thank you for all these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're continuing on in Romans 2, and uh, we've, we've, we've dealt... Uh, with verse 5, and we're kind of getting to the latter half of verse, uh, verse 5 in Romans 2. Uh, look at verse 5 again with me, if you will. He says, But after thy hardness and impentant heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Again, in Romans 2 here, we're starting to, we're, we're again, we're getting into some information. And I want to just point this out that. Uh, there's a lot of details uh, going, going into here, ju the judgment of God and the standard of God's judgment. Um, and I could, we could teach that and go through that, and, and that's what we're doing. But from my understanding, there's a specific design uh, to what's being written here. Uh, again, these saints at Rome are believers. And to kind of tell believers who they used to be is not a bad idea, but it's also you kind of think, well, what's the, what's the purpose? And uh, one of those purposes is not only to inform them what the world they used to be in and, and the predicament they used to be in, but also to train us and equip us to deal with the world, to deal with unbelievers, to deal with unjustified uh, people, so that when we present the gospel to them, we know who we're presenting it to, we know how to present the information, we know what to look for, we know what our response and the information to use uh, in that response, and so there's a, there's a wonderful design in Romans 1, 2, and 3 besides just the Bible data, the Bible facts, uh, the fact of the judgment of God and the standard of his, of his judgment, that's information to be utilized in a specific context, and that is to when we share the gospel and present the gospel to others. And so I want to make that note because we're, again, and, and, and I think we know this, but I, I, I kind of talk about the judgment of God and what it is, but then I go in and I kind of bring it into the scenario of when we, when are we are to present this information when we share it with an unjustified person. And so we're kind of doing two things at once here, uh, and I want to make sure that we're, everyone's aware that that's what we're doing. But again, look at verse 5. Paul has uh, kind of switched gears here now. Uh, we went through and we, we fundamentally understand that the goodness of God, the, long, the long-suffering and forbearance there in, uh, in verse 4, uh, is the, the, the fact that God is revealing His wrath, uh, Romans 1.18 there, but He's not pouring it out. Men and women aren't receiving the wrath of God yet. And that is an aspect of His goodness. He, he's not doing that so, so people would change their mind about Him. 
change their mind about themselves and that their good works can't help them to escape the wrath of God. Ultimately, that they would believe in the way in which God has provided uh, for them to escape God's wrath, and that is through the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemption uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's the goodness there. And man, the, at this point, Paul's deal with uh, this old man here. And again, last, time, last session, we talked about how the nature of the information is being cha has taken a little change. Uh, in Romans 1, Paul was just kind of dealing with the whole world. Kind of gave the genealogy of the nations uh, uh, from back in the Old Testament onward, and that's how the world is still today. But now the nature of the information given in Romans 2 is he kind of singles out someone. He says this, O man, therefore thou art inexcusable, O man. And he's kind of taking this role-playing scenario uh, between this old, old man, this unjustified man who has been proven that the wrath of God is against him, that he's inexcusable, that it's unescapable. And however, even though that's the case, he's still trying to get himself out of it. And he thinks by his own works, by his own goodness, he can escape the wrath of God. And if that doesn't work, he's going to come along and point out at someone else's unrighteousness and think because they're more unrighteous that... I can, that I'm going to escape the, the, the wrath of God. And so Paul's dealing with these, these uh, scenarios here in Romans 2. And what's going to kind of our response to someone who provides that escape tactic uh, to us. Our response is there's a, there's a couple things. One, it's going to be the judgment of God, which is according to truth. And the standard of his judgment. And how you judging someone else uh, based upon your relative goodness Compared, uh, compared between you two, uh, that's not going to help you to escape God's wrath. Your own good works in any way, shape, or form aren't going to help. And what we went through last session, just briefly, is we started to take a look at this old man. Once he's faced with that, the standard of his judgment, which we haven't gotten into yet, but the, the reality is that this escape tactic doesn't work. What most likely, I shouldn't say most likely, it, it'll depend upon the person you're dealing with, but what could take place is that he continues to harden his heart against, against God's word that you're sharing and the messenger. God, his word, and you, the messenger. And uh, uh, there's one thing that we're supposed to inform them of here in verse 5. And again, they're not being led by the goodness of God to change their mind about God and, his, and the judgment of God. But instead, they're being led after their own hardness and impenitent heart. And what that's treasuring up is more and more wrath. More and more wrath to experience on the day of wrath and the revelation of, of the righteous judgment of God. Look at verse 5. He says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now we started to take a look at this issue of the day of wrath, and we noted that that's the time of Jacob's trouble. That's a, a, it's a, actually a day that he's going to that he's going to have, and it's, it's not just oh, a 24-hour day, it's, 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 it's actually seven years, but it's the day of his wrath, the 70th week of Daniel, and, and, and all these terminology, the time of Jacob troubles, the tribulation, and the great tribulation that make it up, all these terms that make up this day of wrath, and then we're going to see the, the revelation, the righteous judgment of God, in which, when he's going to judge people, judge righteously. Come with me quickly to Acts 17. Acts 17, and see this issue of... Uh, Judgment and, and the day of wrath. We need to start getting uh, familiar and acquainted with these terms. Now, uh, what, what Paul's going to be dealing with here, this judgment is talking about the specific day in which he's going to sit on the throne and he's going to judge the nations. Uh, and we're going to break this up. But look at Acts 17. Now, Paul has gotten done talking to him about uh, the, the, the Godhead and, and how uh, God is the, the unknown God here at, at Mars Hill. Uh, he, he informs them that, that, that they've been ignorantly worshiping, worshiping this unknown God. He, he proclaims this unknown God to them, that he is the one that created the heaven and earth and all that's in. Um, and he separated the nations in the bounds of their habitations so that they might seek after him and feel after him because he's not far from them and all these things. But now look at verse 28. Acts 17 verse 28 says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 
For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Verse 30, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. That's the change in their mind about God. Verse 31, Because he hath appointed a what? A day, a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, this, what it's talking about here is the, the revelation, the righteous judgment of God. That is, that God's going to judge the world in righteousness by that man. And he's given assurance of this judgment day by that he raised up the Lord Jesus Christ from, from the dead. That's the assurance that, men in, that when you die, there is life after death, and there's a destiny of that life where, where you're going to go to the hell lake of fire or all eternity with, with God the Father in the heavenly places. And so uh, come with me to um, come with me to Second Thessalonians chapter one. That's that second aspect there being talked about in Romans two, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Let's take a look at this day of wrath. This is, the, the, this is the revelation of the righteous judgment of God as well. But look at, look what, look what's taking place here. You, you can start to see both of these here in this passage. Look what's taking place. Uh, look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 3. He says, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endured. And what's taking place with these Thessalonians is they're going through some great persecution and tribulations, but they're enduring them. And Paul's coming along and he's giving them some comfort, he's giving them some doctrine that's going to work in them to help them with these uh, tribulations and persecutions uh, that they're enduring. Look at verse 5. Now they go through these things and they're enduring them. In verse 5, he says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which, which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. What he's talking about there is that what's going to take place, they're enduring persecution and tribulation right now in this dispensation of, of grace. But what takes place, when they're going to endure those things, and when the rapture takes place, God's going to repay that by tribulation through, through the, the tribulation period. And so he's coming and letting them know that, hey, you're going to be counted worthy of, 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 of uh, what does he say there? Counted worthy of the kingdom of God. That's not on this earth. That's the kingdom of God up, up here. That we're counted worthy of that and that we're not going to partake in this tribulation. However, those that are persecuting and trib uh, and, and, and uh, putting trouble upon you, if they don't change their mind, if they don't believe, that's what they're going to face. Look what he goes on to say in verse, again, verse 6, Seeing is a righteous thing which God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. So these Thessalonians, and we as well as members of the Church of the Body of Christ, are going to be resting when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of His power. And we'll, we'll just stop right there. So he dealt with the tribulation. He's going to recompense tribulation to them. And it's going to start there. If the rapture takes place, there's the, the day of the Lord is going to, going to begin shortly underway. And they're going to experience tribulation. But not only that, but then his, He's going to come and if they live through that, then they're going to experience the flaming fire and taking vengeance. And he's going to sit on a throne and judge the nations. And he's going to, uh, he's going to reveal the righteous judgment of God. And so there's two aspects being taught here. And we need to, again, we need to kind of figure out what's going on. Uh, come back with me to, um, to Romans chapter 2. Now, in order for this to... to, to Make the impact it's supposed to make. 
We need to understand this from both the, those that are going to be living, that, that are going to actually live. They're, they're, if the rapture took place now, those that rejected it and are going to and go through the wrath uh, on this earth and those that die uh, in this dispensation of grace, what, 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 are, you, what are they going to face? What's going to happen? And um, when you look at, again, verse 5, Romans 2, he says, But after thy hardness and penitent heart, Treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and a revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Again, there's two things. This day of wrath being the tribulation period, as we know it, and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now, there's those that are going to be living. And I kind of just wrote a paragraph to help us understand this. There are those that, this, this is true for all mankind. So we've got to make sure that it's those that are going to, we need to know, let people know if they, whether they die or they live they're going to face the day, of, the, the, day of, uh, the day of the Lord, the day of wrath. And that whether they go through and they live, uh, or they die, or they live and they die in the tribulation period, that they're going to face the day of wrath, and that they're going to face the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And I want you, to, I want you guys to kind of to just understand this fundamentally. Uh, the, day of, the day of his wrath, for those that are alive, okay, I have a, I have a chart after all this. Uh, that we'll, we'll take a look at. Let's just say we have a person who we're sharing the gospel with and, or, or a person who they're, they're going to be alive when the rapture takes place. Okay? What, what's going to happen with them? I write, the unjustified man who has despised the, rich, despised the riches of God. That's what we're dealing with in Romans 2. They're, they despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering. Those that despise the riches of God the assumption being that he will be alive when the rapture takes place, okay? So say he's right on that line right there. <clears throat> he will immediately begin to experience, both historically and physically while he lives, the execution of the judgments that will begin to take place on this earth as God judges the world. And men will begin to experience his indignation and his wrath against their iniquity. Uh, you remember the story back here in, in Exodus when God, when Israel, when God brought Israel out of Egypt and the plagues, and God uh, showed His power and His wrath uh, against Egypt there, and He brought them out of Egypt, and uh, you start to see it. Well, that's a type of what's going to take place out here. Um, and if someone is living, and the rapture takes place, they're going to experience that. They're actually going to go through the execution of God's judgments upon this earth. Uh, there's many things involved with that. And they're going to experience the day of wrath on this earth. That's the, that's the backdrop of the dispensation of grace is God's wrath was, was right there. Come with me and see this real quick. Come with me to Psalms 2. Psalms 2. Let's just close this chart here. Get, get Psalms 2 and Acts 2. Look at Psalms 2, verse 1. The psalmist goes on and he says, why do the heathen rage? Okay, so there you have the heathen, all right? The heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing. The people, it's the people of Israel, all right? So you have both Jew and Gentiles involved in this, all right? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth, that, there's the Gentile, that's the, the, the rulership, the leadership of the Gentiles. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. They're taking counsel together. The Jews and the Gentiles taking counsel together against the Lord, that's, that's, that's Jehovah in the Old Testament, and against his anointed, that's, that's the Messiah, it's prophetic. And, that's, uh, and he says, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So let's get them out of our sight. Let's, let's, let's not be, let, let's, they're hard-hearted. They're no, they're they don't want to be impressioned upon. And they just want to cast their cords away from us. Look what takes place when this takes place. Verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall what? 
the Lord shall have them in deri der have them in derision. Now, my understanding is this took place with the cross. You, uh, you have the Jew and the Gentile coming together. They're taking counsel against God and His anointed. Now, Luke 13, uh, they had an extension of one year uh, of mercy and forbearance for them, for God to, to or for, for the Lord and through His, through his apostles to, to get some fruit there in Israel. That doesn't take place. But the next thing that comes on, look what he says, comes on the scene is verse 5. Then shall he speak unto them in his what? Wrath. And vex them in his sore displeasure. Verse 4 he says, And he that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. There, there's a... Uh, we won't get into that. He said, he, he, he's going he's gonna to laugh. That's connection with the, what I was going to say is that there's... there's 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 groups that they take this this laughter and they and they, they talk about the Holy Spirit laughter and they use this verse and they don't understand that the laughing in the context is the, the wrath of God yeah. that He's going to have them in, in derision and so it's not a it's not a very good proof text for their their belief but um, he's gonna he's gonna be laugh his his laugh is you know I I with think about God and and our, and our heavenly Father is He's just been so long suffering. Uh, he, he, and so forbearing and, and so good to mankind. I mean, right back here, when, when the law was instituted and Israel put themselves under it, they broke it right away. We all know that. And he, was, he, was, he had every legal right to just destroy them. They had contracted for that, and he had every legal right. And yet Moses appeals to, to, the, to, to God and, and says, don't, don't bring us out of, uh, out of Egypt for the nations to come along and say, he has brought them out to... to to destroy them and he appeals to that and, 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 and God just he's, he's good and, and once he does that and, and God doesn't destroy them and he says well then I'm going to have an angel lead you into the land not myself and Moses says no if an angel's going to lead us we might as well just go you know be, just might as well just destroy this kind of thing and he says okay well I'm going to lead you and once that takes place Moses says show me your glory what allows you even though we're under this law contract what allows you to still be good and, and still lead us and not destroy us? And that's what takes place when Moses sees his glory and all these things and he proclaims his goodness. And so there's, there's some wonderful aspects of how, how long suffering is. And I just think finally there, there's a time, even with God, where enough is enough. And he's just going to laugh. The time has come. And, and the fool says in his heart, there is no God. If you want to... You want, I just, I just think about that day when it's going to be executed on this earth and then also when he's going to judge him and send him to, to hell in the lake of fire. Um, it's, it's a very serious thing. Well, anyways, that's, what, that's what's taking place. And uh, that, that's what was taking place back here. Now, he ushered in the dispensation of grace. So once the rapture takes place, that's what's on the scene next. Uh, come with me real quick to Acts chapter 2. So that's his wrath, the day of the day of wrath. Uh, I'm just gonna we're gonna look at one uh, passage here, just to get an idea of what's involved with the day of wrath. We could spend a lot of time on this. Uh, we'll eventually do it one point in our edification. Uh, I don't want to go through it right now because you don't necessarily get, need to get into details of these things when you present the gospel to others. Uh, you can you know kind of point out some things as far as. You know, you, you can face the day of wrath. You know, when you die, you're gonna you're gonna face you're gonna face hell and, and go to hell and, and suffer the equivalent of, of what you would face on this earth through that day of wrath. But you don't have to go into any great details. That that's they understand in the heart of hearts that that's serious in itself. Um, and maybe they don't. And maybe they're just one of these hard people, and they're just I mean, that's what they want. And so, uh, we, you don't have, again, you don't have to go into great detail about the, what's going to take place in the day of wrath uh, unless they really want, I mean, unless they really want to know. But uh, look at Acts 2 and look at verse 14. Now, you know the case is day, the day of Pentecost and the, the Spirit came down and, and they're speaking in tongues and, and, and they're testifying to uh, a whole bunch of people there from Jews out of every nation and they're speaking in their tongues 
Um, but look at verse 14. He says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last, what? Days, days saith God. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Look what's going to take place next, though. Verse 19, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. So there's that day of the Lord there. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now you just got a, a few descriptions there of what's going to take place, not only the, the, the pouring out of the Spirit there upon all flesh, but you also have this issue in verse 19, I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. But look at verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. Uh, the, day of, the day of wrath, and the, these things are, there's, there's a little difference between the day of the Lord and day of wrath and things like this. There's, a, there's this time when Jacob's trouble, but then there's also a day in which when he comes back in flaming fire and taking vengeance, that, that day is also recognized. In my understanding, a specific day uh, what I just want us to understand right now is this, this, the day of wrath, this tribulation period. But notice the sun is going to be darkened. I don't know if you ever see, see, I brought this up last session. You guys probably think all I do is watch movies because I always bring up these issues in movies. I used to be a huge movie buff. That's why I get all these things from. But this, you ever see these end of the world movies and things like this? And, 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 and you just, and a lot of them, they don't even represent these things taking place, but nevertheless you have things that, you know, huge earthquakes and things like this taking place and, and uh, you know, floods and all these things taking place and there's just this mass hysteria. I mean, just total chaos. And they don't even portray what God portrays when the sun's darkened and, and, and Job talks about how he has storehouses in heaven, storehouses of hail. And in Revelation, he's gonna, he's gonna, the hail's coming down, and just huge hail that are going to come down and destroy things. And, uh, I mean, the, 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 the fatality numbers, I mean, it's just going to be enormous. And so there's a, there's a, this is a reality. And I know, maybe, maybe not you guys, but I know I have the tendency where I just kind of think, oh, t next day, I, you know, I'm going to go to sleep and wake up the next day type deal. And the next day, you know, and I'm going to, uh, hopefully maybe I'll live, you know, 70 or 80 or something like that. And, you know, I'll live a, a full life. And that's not my father's perspective. My father's perspective is that the next day, the next mo the twinkling of an eye, he says, is not promised. And when we share the gospel to, to, to clarify that truth, that reality, that it could take place at any moment, they could actually face these things. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of denominations and, 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 and a lot of different persuasions believe that, you know, we're going in the, we're in the last times now and all these things. No. <laughs> yeah, we, we haven't seen nothing. And the, the reality is that they could face those things. That's the day of wrath. And they have, if they go through those things, there's, there's so many judgments that God has that he's going to pour out so many things he's going to do. And the, the, there's going to be some that live through it but the, the, most likely, they're going to be ones that, that die in that time. They're going to face a day of wrath. Now, these people that are alive, they're going to face those things, right? They're going to actually go through that day of wrath. And I've been saying it's, it's hell on earth because that's really what it is. Now, if we're going to come back to this, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, but the dead, the, the, the day of wrath, when an unjustified person physically dies, he begins to suffer under the debt and penalty of his sins in hell. And he begins to suffer the kind of sufferings that will be equivalent to what unjustified men will suffer on this earth as they live on the earth uh, when that day of wrath occurs. 
So when Paul comes along and says they treasure, treasure us up unto themselves, wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of righteous judgment of God, that goes according to both dead or living. If they live, they're going to experience it on this earth. If they die in this dispensation, they're going to experience, they're going to go to hell. But what hell is like is, is the equivalent of suffering those things. You kind of start to understand what the hell is for, the purpose of hell. You have the lake of fire too when he's going to cast hell and, and death and, and those things in the lake of fire. But hell is, is that's, what they are, that's what they're experiencing. When someone died and went to hell, they're experiencing what he's pouring out, what he's going to physically and visibly pour out in that day of wrath. That's what they're suffering in hell. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if they live, they're going to face the actual execution of God's judgment on this earth. Or if they die in this dispensation, they're going to suffer the equivalent of that. Now look at this next issue. Come back with me to Romans 2. Romans chapter 2. This is really important, again, I, I brought this up last session, it's really important to understand this twofold aspect of, of God's wrath, the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, because when that, that's what takes place with an unjustified person. Well, when you're justified, you are, you are no longer going to experience those things. Uh, in fact, you're not, you're not going to experience a day of wrath, you're going to experience a day of glory. We look, just looked at that Second Thessalonians chapter 1 passage where it talked about when the Lord returns, you, you're going to be resting with us. There's rest involved. And so when Paul comes along in Romans 5 there and says we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, our hope is the glory of God, but to understand that glory is, is the opposite of what we're learning when it comes to this day of wrath. There's a day of glory and we're not going to experience the revelation of the righteous judgment of God because the righteous judge, we're, we're imputed God's righteousness. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's glory that we're going to be partaking in when that judgment takes place. But nevertheless, there's this, two thing, there's this twofold breakdown of, the, of, uh, of God's wrath. Now, the day of wrath, but then there's this also this next one, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now that's a specific judgment. From my understanding, that's when he, he's going to sit on a throne and he, and he judges. Now, this one's a little bit, I mean, this one's a little bit more complex. Not complicated, but complex in understanding this. Now, those that are living, okay, what the, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I write, uh, uh, sorry, not only that, not only that of the, the uh, day of wrath here. Not only that, but if he survives and lives through the, through the time, right? If he's, he, if he's living and he goes through that day of wrath, there might be a, a possibility that, that they survive. Again, we don't have to go into all this detail when you're presenting this. Or something. That's why I kind of told you there's two things we're, we're doing here. Uh, he, will face also, uh, he will also face having to stand at the righteous judgment of God, which will take place at the end of the fifth installment of the fifth course of punishment in preparation for the establishment of his kingdom. Just ho hold on there. I wanted to show you this. I got a chart here. We explained these courses of punishment last session. Well, under this fifth course, there's five installments. The first installment started with King, uh, with King Nebuchadnezzar there. It goes on. This third installment makes up the gap between the Old and New Testament, the, the 350 years there of silence, the famine of God's word. The fourth installment started with John the Baptist. Uh, that's why he's, a, he's one of the greatest prophets, because he started, he was going to be the prophet that prepared the way of the Lord. Um, and, and the fourth installment, the Lord came, that's when he came, the Messiah came, and all those things. Well, the fifth installment is this day of wrath. The, the Lord's day of wrath. That's the fifth installment. And so they could live through that. That's what I mean about that fifth installment. Um, and so if that takes place, that's gonna, the, this, this revelation of righteous judgment, there's going to take place at his second coming, as we, as we call it. God's going to judge, or Christ, when he, before he establishes his kingdom, he's going to judge uh, where all, right, I'm right here, where all of that uh, man's works and goodness and human righteousness and whatever else he has ever thought would make him right with God is going to be judged by the norms and standards of absolute righteousness. 
And all that is going to be compared to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. We looked at that, Acts 17. And when it is clearly seen to not match his righteousness, you not, uh, he will not only just have went through the, the day of wrath that he went through, but he's also going to be cast into the lake of fire forever. And so at this time, he's going to go through the day of wrath, this person. If he survives it, when the Lord comes, before he establishes his kingdom, he's going to have a judgment. We're going to go there and just look at a couple things. And in, in, I believe it's in Matthew 23. And he's going to judge the nations, the, the sheep and the goats. He's going to separate them. And there's going to be those where he casts into the, to the, uh, into the lake of fire there. And that's where they're going to, that's, their, that's it. That's, that's all they got. And so they faced, not only did they face the day of wrath, but they also faced the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, and they were thrown into the lake of fire. Now, if they... I have to make sense of all this stuff, so <laughs> this, is, this is what we're, we're going through. I, I, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking, I hope I didn't lose you guys. But you, the Bible talks about these things, and, and you, you'll see different judgments, you'll see different people here and there, and you're wondering, you're, 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 at least in my mind, you're wondering, like, well, weren't they dealt with back there? And now they're here and, and all these things. And so I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. Now, if this person who lived when the rapture took place and he lived through and he started to take, uh, go through the day of wrath, okay, there's going to be some that live and, and, and experience the judgment of God when the Lord was the second coming, but there's going to be also those that live through the rapture, but then they die during the day, the, day of, uh, the day of wrath. They're going to go to hell, and these guys are going to be raised up at the great white throne. And so they, but they both, no matter what, you're, what I'm trying to prove, is no matter what, you're facing the day of wrath, or the equivalent thereof in, in hell, and the revelation of righteous judgment of God, either at his second coming, or at the great white throne when they're resurrected and then thrown into the lake of fire. Does that concept make sense? Okay. So when Paul, when Paul comes along and says this in just very general terms, a lot of this is to be understood even before we get here uh, from the Old Testament. This is what's been taught. Um, and so when Paul comes along in, in Romans 2 verse 5, and he says, But after thy hardness and penitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, no matter if, you, if the rapture takes place and you live, you're going to face the day of the Lord's wrath. If you die, you're going to face the day of the Lord's wrath, the equivalent thereof, in hell. If you go through and you live and you're, uh, you're, you're taking part of God's wrath on this earth and you die during that time, you're going to go to hell and, 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 and suffer the, the, the equivalent of. If you live through it, that judgment, you're going to, that's a revelation of the righteous judgment of God, you're going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Well, if you die, you're going to go to hell, you're going to be raised, they're going to be risen again and judged at that great white throne judgment and then cast into the, to the lake of fire. Now, I, I did a little chart. I don't know if you're going to be able to see it. So I got a guy right here, okay? This guy's living... He, the rapture took place, and he's, he's living. He's starting to experience the Lord's day of wrath, okay? He's going to go through the day of wrath. Again, everything I just said, I'm just trying to recap it. He's going to go through the day, of, the day of wrath right here. Now, if he dies, again, he's going to go and, and, and be in hell and then be risen again this, this, at this great white throne. Two judgments here. Now there's this guy who's living. If he dies during a dispensation of grace... He's going to go through the day of wrath, but it's in hell. It's the equivalent of, of that. And uh, you can't see that, but there's another arrow go, going up there to the great white throne, and then he'll be judged at the great white throne judgment. So no matter what, what, what Paul's saying, no matter what, whether you live and then die, or if you live and then you're there, if you, you know, whatever, you're going to, <laughs> this unjustified person is going to experience the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. That's their dismal, their dark and gloomy hope. That's what they, they, they have to look forward to. And so what our response is, if they don't change their mind in the matter of the judgment of God and that their own goodness, their own works, isn't going to provide the way to, of escape and they want to continue down this path, continue to stay in their state of hardness and not be able to be impressed upon by, by God's word, then we let them know that 
what you have to face is the day of God's wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And each time, and the more and more you reject it, the more and more you're treasuring up wrath against that day of wrath. That's your hope. That's all you have to look forward to. And that's the, that's the reality. That, that, that is to be our response. Now, are, are there any questions on that? No one wants to raise their hand. They're like, I don't want to hear all that again. <laughs> I don't want to hear all that again. Come on now. Well, it's on a DVD. If you need to hear I don't want to say it again. <laughs> that, was, that was a lot. But it's, it's on DVD and CD. We, we, can, uh, we, can, we can, you know, if there's any questions on that, we can get that. But what you really need to know, again, is just that an unjustified person in experiencing the wrath of God is going to experience both the day of, the wrath, day of his wrath or the equivalent thereof, and they're going to experience a judgment in connection with that and be either go to hell and then to the lake of fire or just go to the lake of fire. And so that's what their, their dismal hope is. Uh, look, at, look now with me. Uh, in verse 5, Paul started this long sentence here in verse 5, and it doesn't end until verse 11. And what he's getting into now at the end of verse 5 He's talked about the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And he says in verse 6, he's starting to describe this. He says, who will render to every man according to his deeds. What, is, what does to render mean? What does render mean? Repay. To repay? Yeah. What else? Give. To give. Yeah. He's going to give them what, what they deserve according to their deeds. Now... When you just read that, you know, uh, 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 there might be a lot of unjustified people who come along and say, yes, good. Uh, and according to their own judgment, their own standard of judgment, they think that they've measured up. They think that, yeah, I'm, I'm good. And that's why we need, to, we need to understand the standard of God's judgment. Notice what he says again in verse 2, Romans 2.2. 2. He says, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to what? Truth. Truth. And then again, look at verse 5 uh, at the end there. He calls it the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. This is a, this is a right judgment. The, what, is, what, is, what does judgment mean? Judgment, you can use it in a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different shades of meaning and a lot of senses to it. But what, is, what does judgment mean? Decision, yep. Verdict. What's it? Per, what? Verdict. Verdict. What else? <coughs> What's that? The debt owed. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Money that's owed. You something that's, yeah, something that's owed. Justice. Justice, yeah. Yes, it's something that, you know, when, there, when there, a judgment is made, you know, the judge takes into account everything. You know, he's listened to the case, you know, and it's the, the jury's involved there too, but, the, you know, the judge takes it all into, into focus and he's going to make a judgment and determine the sentence. And God, what, again, one of, part, that one of the aspects of his goodness is that he's, right here, he's given the standard of his righteous judgment. And he's doing that to see if you measure up. Is your goodness measure up? Now, it's pretty simple. Look what he goes on to say, again, in verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his deeds. He's going to render, it, it, this, his judgment is in accordance to, is, it's in line with their deeds, his, his deeds, his works, what he, what he can produce. Look what he goes on to say in verse 7. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. We're just going to stop right there. Now he kind of just gives, he just gives two, two, sides, two sides of it. But you need to understand, this, this is why edification is so important and sense and sequence is so important. Because when he comes along and says, to them, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. And then in verse 8 he says, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. 
Paul has already proved their unrighteousness. And see, God's judgment isn't coming along and it's some balancing act. It's not coming along and says, well, if you're, if you're doing good, doing more good than bad, then that's, that's, that's good. You're going to escape the judgment of God. No. To those that are by patient continuance and well-doing, seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life. And by coming along and, and saying the other half, but unto them who are con that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath. By saying that other side, he's, he's coming along and saying, you have to be patient, continuous, and well-doing, and have not at one point obey, any, uh, obey unrighteousness. Because if you have any, uh, any unrighteousness on your account, that has to be paid for. And God's going to judge that. And so, when you first read that, you're thinking, you know, again, an unjustified person would come along and they would say, to them who by uh, patient continuance and well-doing, seek for glory, honor, and immortality, eternal life, they might be coming along and saying, patient continuance and well-doing, well, yeah. And you might have a person who, from their childhood up, yeah, they've been pretty good. They, they, you know, in, in the eyes of this world, and they were brought up good, and, and they were always that, you know, the teacher's pet, and they got good grades, and they, they went to college, and they got a diploma, they got a great job, making a lot of money, they're friendly with their neighbors, they never lied, they never stole, you know, all these things. And they come along, and they say, oh yeah, I've been patient, continuous, and well-doing, therefore I should receive eternal life. And then you have that especially, and that person comes along and looks at a fellow brother or sister, another person in the world who hasn't lived like they've lived, well, God would just be unrighteous to not give me eternal life. They're going to hell, and I'm way better than them. That's where this is all coming into play here. And God's judgment is in that. It's not a balancing act. Now, however balance they want to make, however small balance they want to make, what he's saying there, in, 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 in terms, he's saying you have to be righteous for your whole life. Patient continuance to them who by patient continuance in well-doing. They have to be in, in continuance. Continuance is a, it's just a continual thing in well-doing. And by bringing on, again, by bringing on the latter half of the judgment, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they're going to get indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, is that if you have one of those things on your record, one of those things being Romans 1, 28 through 32 there, being filled with all unrighteousness, in verse 29, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. We have one of those things, or, or the fruit of one of those things. On your account, you have to pay for that. You have to pay for that unrighteousness. And the wages of sin is death. Not only are you going to physically die, but you have to, you, because you can't pay for that now on this, uh, in your lifetime, you have to pay for that in the life to come for all eternity. So the standard of God's judgment is you have to be righteous without any unrighteousness because if you have unrighteousness, you've got to pay for that unrighteousness. And that's the standard of his, of, his, of his judgment. And so these men are coming along and they're judging horizontally. They're coming along, and, and, and I brought the, this, uh, this, this example of, of a guy who commit five, you know, he's killed five people, and this guy's only committed one. Well, look at it, he's five, and I only got one. Bob came up to me and he said, but the, you know, the common denominator is, but yeah, you, you still murdered one. You still murdered. The common denominator is the unrighteousness. It's the, the, the sin that's been produced. And that has to be judged. That has to be taken into account. And so, but again, look at verse 7. I want you to see something else as well. Romans 2 verse 7 says, To them who are by, by patient continuance and well-doing, 
He doesn't say to them by, who by patient continuance and you took a day off. That's, that's, that's just your life. But notice again verse 7. After that he says, In well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality to them who have eternal life. But they seek for glory. And again, what we've learned, look at verse 23 of Romans 1. This is what, they, they, what, what they're, they're seeking for, but look, if they want a fair deal, this is what they'll get. Look, verse 23, says, And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to a corruptible man, into birds of four-footed beasts and creeping things. They change the glory of the uncorruptible God into, a, into the glory, into an image made like to a corruptible man. The you want glory, all their glory can amount to is the glory of corruptible man. And again, that, that being just unrighteousness and the judgment of that. And they're not seeking him out. Come back with me real quick to Acts 17. Acts 17, Acts 17, verse, verse 27. Again, he's talking about God here. In verse, look at verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Did these guys at Mars Hill seek the Lord and find him? No, because if they did, they wouldn't have the idols all around them. And they wouldn't have the one idol to come along and make sure that we, we, we got every god and come along and say, to the unknown god. If they were to seek out after him, all they would, have, they would just be worshiping God. And so the reality is, is that when God separated the nations and went, they went into the bounds of their habita habitation, is that they didn't seek after God. Most of them aren't seeking after God right now. And they're accountable to that. They're going to be judged for that. And the, you, know, you always get the question, what if someone who hasn't heard, God's going to judge them. He's going to, he's going to judge them. They're not seeking after him. If they were, they would they, they, they'd be saved. They, they would have the gospel. God would provide that. He's... he's he wants people to be saved. But God can judge someone even because they're not seeking after Him. Even if they've never heard the gospel. It's because they don't want it. And whether you believe that or not, that's what God's Word says. And it might hurt. And it might not feel right and just. But it is just. Because they don't want Him. It's all, you know, you get that argument too. What about, you know, my uncle? I, I hope he's listening, actually. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that in a, in a mean way. I say it honestly. You know, he, he brings up the argument, well, you know, God in the Old Testament, you know, thou shalt not kill, you know, and all these things. And he's going through the nations and he's just destroying the nations. How can God be just? How can he do that? Because they didn't want him. They don't want nothing to do with him. They're opposed to him. They hate him. They're, 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 they're of the adversary. They're in direct opposition. They got their own religious system. They got their own idolatry in play. They, they don't want him. And what Paul, again, what he's bringing up, this guy who's despising the riches of his goodness, is that these guys are still out there today, and they're not in the third world of countries. They're in every nation and they don't, they're, they're opposed to him. And again, we, we need to be aware of that. And it's not your fault. With the information you're giving and you sharing it, uh, uh, effectually you sharing it and, 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 and recognizing these things and utilizing the information properly as it's been taught, that's your job. And it's not your job to convert someone. It's not your job for, to, for them to believe. That's up to them. It's one, it's one of the, it's, I understand it's hard. It's one of the questions, the questions you might get all the time is that 
No one's believing. No, no I, uh, my family, those I share it with, they're just not, they're not getting it. I give them the information, that, that's not your job. That's up, that's up to them. With the information, God's word working effectually in them. And you've you got to be aware of that. Otherwise, there's a tendency and a, a very subtle but tactic of the adversary is to take that and creep that and try to gain an advantage of you so that you change the message or you stop sharing the message. You stop sharing the information. Paul says, in season, out of season, preach the word. And when it comes to the gospel, preach the word of reconciliation. Preach the word of truth. The gospel, the grace of God and truth. And knowing, not, don't, don't change and please men, but please God. Uh, come with me, quick, get, get, um, go back to Romans 2 and get with me and we'll conclude 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Just like to exhort you guys as we conclude. We're going to get more into this, the standard of this judgment in the next session, uh, next week. Again, I'll just read uh, Romans 2, verse 6 and, and downward. He says, Who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor, immortality, eternal life, but unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Uh, one thing I'll just point out, you can study this issue uh, until next week, but notice there in verse 8, at the end there, he says indignation and wrath. And then he, there's a comma and he says tribulation and anguish. Each one of those, the, the indignation and wrath, that lines up with the day of wrath. If you understand what indignation and wrath is, that's what they're going to experience in the day of wrath. The... The next grouping there, the tribulation and anguish, that's what they're going to, the, the consequence of that, the revelation of the righteous judgment of God, that's what they're going to get from, from that. And so that's why it's broken up in the two groupings there. Uh, come with me quickly to, again, we'll get into more of that uh, next week. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. One of the things that we're going to spend some time in uh, once we're done going through Romans chapter 3 we're going to kind of take a look at some wonderful verses that talk about um, our presentation of the, uh, of the gospel to others and how God views that and how uh, for us to keep going, keep doing it, and, 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 and keep sharing the message. And, and, and we're, we're getting a lot of it now, but we're going to look at other passages that make us aware of what we're going to face um, and what is out there and things like that. But I want to just end on this, this passage here in 2 Corinthians 3 uh, and see... Your labor, you're co-laboring with the Father. See, God is behind the evangelism program. Uh, hold your hand here. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 real quick. Look at chapter 5. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. Now, he, he, we've gone through these verses before, but just look at this. He says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you. And if you were just leave it there, that's the evangelism. God did beseech you, but then the honor of privilege of those next two words, by us. It's God that's beseeching. By us. And so God is behind the evangelism program today. And we need to understand his mind on the matter. And that's why I share these things about what, your, what our job is as ambassadors. What we are to share. And, and if someone doesn't believe or someone spits on you or whatever, it's, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. And to make sure that you don't change the message and you don't quit. And there's passages like these that come and just comfort the, the, the inner man and allow you to keep pressing on because you see what your father starts to see. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 14. Now again, he's, pre he's talking about preaching Christ's gospel there in verse 12. Verse 14, he says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. 
and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now he's going to further explain this in verse 15. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. Who is sufficient for these things? Paul comes along and he makes this wonderful statement that when you look at this, the situation and circumstance of, the thing, of, of, of you sharing the gospel and those rejecting it, Paul comes along and he's done that. He's out there. I mean, he's, he, he's the apostle of the Gentiles. And he comes along and he says, Now thanks be unto God which always, every single time, causeth us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now I look at that passage and I say, Paul, what do you mean? Come on, there's people rejecting you. I mean persecuting you. Reviling you. You're talking about the resurrection and they mock you. They say you're beside yourself. You're crazy. And he says, God always causes us to triumph in Christ. In every place. And he explains that by saying, for we are unto who? Unto God. It's not a matter of who we are unto people, but who we are unto God. But we are unto God, a sweet savor of Christ. And he explains the sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that are perished. Those that are going to receive the message and thereby be saved, and those that thereby reject the message and thereby perish. Both of them. You, you've done your job. And in both of them, sharing the message to both of them, no matter what their response, you are a sweet savor of, of, of Christ. You're a sweet savor unto God. And you can always triumph in Christ. Because it's the message that's the most important. Look at what he says in verse 17 as well, though. He says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity... But as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And that's what we want to make sure of, is that we get the message down, we know we're, we're, have the information to utilize it and, and share it with the unjustified, uh, men, uh, unjustified world, but then to make sure that if this takes place, those that were the death unto death to, and we don't see the fruit, and we don't see their decision, we don't see their response, their good response, or you know, whatever it is, to make sure that we are not as of the many. Because that's what's, gonna, that's what's commonplace in Paul's time. It's commonplace today, is that because of these things, there's many which corrupt the word of God. And we ought not to corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. That's, that's what, what's taking place. That's what's starting to be built up in us in Romans 1 and 2, is the information that's going to allow us to, one, know what we're going to face when we share the gospel with others, uh, who they are, also what they're going to say to us, and the information for us to give to them at the, uh, at the outset and also in response to their vain thinking and their vain responses. And all of that and you don't really see it right now. You get the passages later like this one where it comes along and says, all that is a sweet savor unto God. It's not, we got another one on the list. I can mark it down. Yes, let's go get another one. That, that's good, but when you don't start seeing the check marks and the list of all the people that you've helped and that have been converted through you sharing, that's not the issue. The issue is what God sees, that you're getting the message out no matter the, the results of it. What an honor and privilege that even in the, when there's no response, that God is glorified and we're still unto him a savor, a sweet savor unto him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time looking at uh, one of the very first things that you teach us in our edification uh, to be a co-laborer with you in getting the gospel of Christ, the gospel, the grace of God, out to the world. And you do that by informing us and increasing our understanding of what the world is like, uh, what the, how the world is going to respond to this message. 
and uh, to encourage us to be faithful no matter what the result and to make us aware that no, no matter what, no matter, the, no matter what the result is, that that is pleasing unto you. Father, what, what genius is being displayed here right, right out the, at the outset of Romans? Romans 1 and 2. You could have been talking about anything else, and yet you talk about getting the message out that we have become beneficiaries of. The message that is, puts on display your power and can activate your power in the hearts and minds of those that are unjustified now, if they would believe. Father, we thank you that you are beseeching others and that we get to partake in that, that you beseech others by us. I pray that these things would become more and more a part of us, that we would esteem these things highly, um, and that we would put these things into practice, that it wouldn't just become Bible data, Bible facts, but that we would start to have these things motivate us to go out there and share the glorious gospel of Christ and provide a people the, the chance to hear this glorious news and that we would hold forth the word of life and shine as lights in this present evil world. Father, we thank you for this honor and privilege. I thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he made it all possible, that he died on the cross to pay for our sins, was buried and rose again. If no one has trusted in him as their all-sufficient Savior, I'd pray so that they do so now, that the wrath of God is against them, that if they die now or we're raptured out of here, that they will receive and start to experience the day of wrath, and that they will, it, it will not be pretty. And that God... Has, that, Father, that you have provided a way of escape for them through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that they would believe so now and have all their sins forgiven, be imputed your righteousness, which is what they need because your wrath is against unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, and that they would become an inheritor of the eternal life that they might be seeking that they can't gain on their own. Father, we thank you for uh, this glorious good news that we get to not only partake of, but share it with others. Thank you for this time of grace giving as well. We know we don't give grudgingly or out of necessity, but willfully and cheerfully, uh, according to your, how your word has worked effectually in us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>